So I like to think that on this channel, we've made some pretty impressive things over the years. And that includes making spur gears, spur gears, and uh, more spur gears. Okay, so let's be real. The only type of gear I've been able to make so far is a spur gear. They're also called plain cut gears, and they're characterized by that straight cut of the tooth. And the reason why I've been able to make them is because they're relatively straightforward to make. All you really need to make them is a set of gear cutters, and an expensive dividing head, and a milling machine. Oh, and of course a lathe to make the blank. But then, once you have all those things, you can very easily make your own gears, which you could very easily buy off eBay. But at least when you make them yourself, the dimensions, you know, the thickness, the hole sizes, the key weights, and the material can all be customized to suit your need. And back when I was using the old mini lathe, being able to make my own custom changed gears was a real lifesaver. However, the problem among many with spur gears is they aren't hugely space efficient when you want to do large speed reductions. For example, this is the largest and smallest spur gear that I have. The largest one has 80 teeth and the smallest one has 20. If the smaller gear is the drive, or I guess the input shaft, it's going to take four spins to turn that 80 tooth gear once. So effectively, that's a four to one reduction in speed, or if you will, a four times increase in mechanical advantage. Now for some applications, that might be fine, but for others, that's nowhere enough. Our options then are to simply reduce the number of teeth on the import gear. However, there's only so far that we can shrink a spur gear, and from memory, the lowest limit for this type of spur gear is going to be 17 or 18 teeth, which means we're already at our low end. Now obviously if you wanted to, you could go the other way, in just increasing the size of the driven gear. There's no theoretical upper limit, but really you are going to run into problems of how much space do you have to work with, and how big of a gear can you actually make. Because with my dividing head, the largest I could go is 200 teeth. And even if you did that, you'd only get a 10 to 1 reduction if you paired it with a 20 tooth gear. Not to mention, that would take up a huge amount of material in order to make it. You could also stack the gears to make a double reduction, but the more you do that, the more inefficiencies, more noise, and more space you're going to take up is going to soon become a problem, at least depending on the reduction that you're looking for. So instead, I think we should try a different type of gear altogether. So inside the PowerFeed gearbox is a worm drive. There's a worm screw down the bottom and a worm wheel or a worm gear up the top. The screw is connected to the motor and that's sort of the driven gear and that's always the driven gear in this type of setup. Now the way this works is that for every complete turn of the screw, the gear is going to advance one tooth. And according to my rough counting, there's 60 teeth on this worm wheel, so it's going to take 60 turns of the screw from the motor to turn the gear once. That's going to be a 60 to 1 reduction in speed, or a 60 times increase in torque. And that's effectively what makes this small 12 volt motor so powerful once you connect something up to the gearbox. Although you are sacrificing speed in terms of RPM in order to get that high mechanical advantage. The other cool thing about this type of gear is that they're very good at opposing rotational force when it comes through the driven shaft. So pretty much only the worm screw can be responsible for any movement. That pretty much means you can lock the driven wheel in place and it's not going to be able to turn itself. I think one example would be the mechanism which allows you to tune the strings on a big double bass. The string is tensioned by a shaft that's connected to a worm wheel, but it's all held firmly in place due to friction. Interestingly enough though, a worm shaft is just a gear rack, except instead of being cut in a straight profile, the profile is a helix, and instead of the rack moving backwards and forwards, it instead rotates. Which I guess is an important thing to keep in the back of your mind when it comes to making them. So I guess let's start off with the easy one first, and that's simply going to be to make the worm screw, which we can very easily do on the lathe. The profile that we're looking to cut though is a little bit different to the normal 60 degree V that we'd use for a normal screw. The gears that I use are a module one with a 20 degree pressure angle. Now without getting too caught up in gear two theory, essentially what that means is we need a cutter with a 20 degree angle on each side, which effectively adds up to 40 degrees in total. 
with a small flat on the end. It's effectively the same profile that we'd cut if we were going to cut a gear rack. If you want to find out exactly why, I'll leave a link explaining profile angle, but that's essentially what it boils down to. Now I don't currently have a 40 degree V cutter, so I'll freehand grind it from a high speed steel blank, and I'll check it against a profile guide just to make sure that it's being ground properly. Alright, I think that looks pretty good. With the cutter now made, we still have another issue, and that's being able to cut the required pitch which we need to make the proper worm screw. The thing is, with gears, the tooth spacing, or I guess the pitch in this instance, is pi times the module. I'm using module 1 gears, so the pitch we need to cut is 3.14 times 1. So effectively 3.14. Now I know some lathes have changed gears which are dedicated for cutting module pitches, but my one unfortunately doesn't. Now that would be the end of the video there, except we can work around it because there are a lot of other modules which we can work with. I simply got a spreadsheet and plugged all the gear modules times pi, and these are the results. Whilst most of them are going to be completely unusable, you'll see that module 0.8 is pretty much 2.5mm. Okay, it's a little bit over, but considering the scale that we're working with, and considering that we can add a bit of tolerance to the design, 0.8 module should be just fine. Now according to the chart, the depth that we need to cut is simply going to be the addendum plus the dedendum. So here that's going to be 2.25 times the module. So 2.25 times 0.8 is 1.8 millimeters off the radius. Alright, and that's our basic worm cut. Now I should quickly point out that if you want to reduce the amount of speed reduction that you're getting from this type of setup, you could very easily double the pitch and have a double start thread. I'll also add that if you really wanted to, you could cut these with a milling machine. From what I can tell, it may be quicker if you do it that way because you can mill the profile in one pass instead of doing several like I did here. However, if you want to do that, you'll need a universal milling machine and universal dividing head in order to make that helical profile. It's somewhat similar to my helical milling setup, but it's going to be a lot more complex because it should allow you to index the cutter to make multi-start threads, and it's going to be a lot more expensive. And also, mine doesn't cut pie pitches. With the worm screws now made, we now need to make the gears, which is deceptively more complicated than you might think. First thing to do is I had to order a set of these module 0.8 cutters. They're exactly like my module 1 cutters, just a little bit smaller. There's 8 different cutters in this set, and each tooth is designed to cut a particular range of teeth. 
And this is because the shape of the gear will change depending on the tooth count on the gear. Before I can use it though, I will need to make up a small arbor in order to hold the gear cutter. So with the gear cutter arbor made, let's try and make a gear. And I'm gonna start off by making something which I'm gonna dub a not a worm gear so we can hopefully understand exactly what a worm gear is. We'll first start off with an actual worm gear. This is the one that rides on the lathe's lead screw. And as you can probably see, whilst the side profile perfectly matches up with a normal gear, and you know, it probably should, you know, they're both module one, the front on profile should show that the teeth are actually slanted backwards. So what I'll simply do is I'll measure the slant of the worm screw, which is roughly two degrees tangent at the center of the screw. So I'll set up the dividing head and tilt it upwards at a two degree angle. I've set it up so that the middle of the gear is going to be cut on the center. Nothing else left to do but get this gear cut. Alright, and that's our not a worm gear and our worm screw. And on first impressions, well, they're okay. You know, they seem to mesh well enough. And once again, moving it this way should show that this is simply a gear rack with a helical profile. It also spins under power. You know, it's a little bit rough, but it does spin. In fact, let me quickly make a housing for it. 
And with it now in its housing, we can hopefully better see it in action. Okay, so at this point, I should probably explain why I keep saying this is a not a worm wheel. And the answer simply is because it isn't. A proper worm tooth simply isn't cut at an angle, like it's cut here. It's actually cut slightly curved too. In a sense, it's actually a helical gear, and it better follows the profile of the helical screw. That, of course, isn't what's occurring here. The teeth are simply cut at an angle, and all that effectively means is all the force is going to be going through one single point, which is surely going to cause a fair amount of wear over time. With that said though, it is similar enough to a proper worm wheel that I think you can get some use out of it. I think if your goal is simply to use this as a setup for symbol dividing or positioning in say a low use or low force environment, I don't see why a basic setup like this wouldn't be out of the scope. Because if you're already able to make gears, simply tilting the dividing head isn't exactly the hardest thing to do. Anything outside of doing simple positioning though, I wouldn't recommend this type of setup. I guess if you need a proper worm drive, you need a proper worm drive. And that brings us on to making, well, a proper helical worm gear. Now generally speaking, being able to make proper helical gears has been outside of the capabilities of this workshop. And let's be real, it still is. Proper helical gears need to be hobbed on a universal milling machine with a universal dividing head. The reason for this is you need to sync or chain the rotation of the cutter, or I guess the gear hob, to the rotation of the dividing head so they spin together to cut that profile. And obviously this is something that not my milling machine nor my dividing head can do. But obviously that isn't going to stop me, because there is another method which you can use to make worm wheels. And that's called free hobbing, and thankfully that can be all done on the lathe. First things first though, we need to make a gear hob, which is pretty much a universal gear cutter, which serendipitously looks like a worm wheel with a bunch of teeth cut into it. With the lathe work now done, I'll use the dividing head to make the teeth. The first cut will make the cutting edge, and the second is going to create the clearance behind the tooth. With the cutter now made, I now need to quench harden it in order to make it a proper cutting tool. Alright, and that's the steel now hardened up. I'll pop it in the oven to temper it, and whilst it does its thing tempering, I'll go ahead and make the rest of the things that we need in order to free hob. Firstly, I need a stud with a very accurately cut shaft. The shaft needs to locate the gear properly, but it can't be too tight as to restrict movement. 
I also need a spacer to bring the gear up to height with the hob. With it all done, let's get it all set up. I'll be doing the first test with the previous gear that I made. I want to see if I can add the helical profile to an already cut gear. As you can see, the helix is able to advance the worm. I mean, it effectively is a worm screw with a bunch of teeth cut into it, so that's not a huge surprise here. But as well as advancing the gear, we also need it to cut away the material in order to create that helical profile. Now I'm running this at about 80 RPM, which is the lowest I can go for this lathe, and I think this is still a little bit too high for this type of job. But for what it's worth, it's certainly cutting in that helical profile, and I think it's doing a pretty clean cut too. And I don't know about you, but for a first try, I think that is a pretty good result. And visually, it's not too different from the lathe's one, although the worm screw is definitely larger, you know, diameter-wise, on the lathe. And you can definitely see that difference in diameter on each gear. And thankfully, the worm works really great under load too. And the action between the gear and the worm screw is definitely a lot smoother now that it has its new helical profile. However, because we started with a fully formed gear and then we cut into it, the resulting worm gear is actually cut undersized. So what we need to do now is we need to start from the very beginning with a blank and then we need to hob that profile into it. And that's exactly what I didn't do because for this to work, we need the helix of the hob to advance the gear, which is very difficult to do with a gear blank. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a method called gashing, which is very commonly used on gears. Simply put it, I use the tilted setup in the dividing head to cut the gear tooth but I'm only doing it at about half depth. This way the hob has something to turn to advance the gear to the next tooth. But at the same time, we haven't cut in so far that we aren't able to create the full helical profile, or at least the profile of the worm gear. And this time I have added some spring washers to keep the gear in place because it was bouncing around a little bit last time. But you do need to be careful about the amount of force that you put down on the gear. Because too much force acting on the gear is simply going to bind up the gear and the hob is just going to chew through the tooth. Alright, and that's our worm gear, or I guess as close as we're going to get in this workshop with this type of setup. And thankfully, once again, the engagement is smooth with very little backlash, and most importantly, it's properly on size. So I guess I can definitely call this a big success. So I guess expect this type of setup to pop up soon in a future project. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.